Hi, I'm Brian Drucker here with Lawrence Krauss, somewhere in the Drake Passage on the way uh, from Antarctica from the ASU Origins Project cruise. And um, just had a few questions. I figured since we started out in Antarctica, it should start off with climate change. Okay. And how do we know that climate change is really happening and that it's largely caused by human activities? Well, um, in fact, as you, as you know, I gave a lecture here, about right. it, but there's a tremendous amount of data looking at both the carbon dioxide levels over human industrial history and way back before humans were even, um, in the modern version of humans were even around, before Homo sapiens were around. Um, and by looking at ice cores in places like uh, Antarctica, we can monitor both the, the general temperature and and carbon dioxide levels, and, and, it's, and then it's simple physics at some level that when that carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, which absorbs in one wavelength and re-emits in, in, in other wavelengths, um, to estimate the pressure and the radiative forcing. And so one could do models, but the mo more importantly, the, the data is such that first of all, you can just see the incredible rise of carbon dioxide to levels almost twice of what it's been over the last 800,000 years. But then there are other things that don't relate to temperature at all. As I said, we can measure the pH of the ocean. The increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere produces carbonic acid in the oceans, and, and, you can ch and the change is exactly what you get by increased carbon dioxide. Moreover, the increased carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere is exactly what you'd expect given human industrial activity. So everything fits. It's, it, you, know, you could argue with some grand conspiracy, but everything fits. And at the same time, temperature changes, ice melting, all of these things have been happening. Uh, not all, we could predict things that will happen, but for the past 30 years, we've been able to measure changes that are completely consistent with that. So, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, a thousand different ways, it's probably a duck. So, why do you think the majority of people who deny climate change do? Do you think it's for religious reasons, political reasons, or do you think it's just deficient education? Well, I, I, I think the in the first case, you have to realize that there's a concerted effort to try and manipulate information uh, related to climate change in the media. And there are people who's, who, for one reason or another, feel it's in their interest to, politically or economically, to deny the, the evidence of, of climate change and deny the work of scientists who've been mo building models to try and model that change. Um, I think it's a, a, a combination of direct money being spent to provide misinformation. For some people, it's a sense that, it, we, it's the same sense that in some sense gets people not accepting evolution. I mean, there's obviously a religious bent to it that somehow people, some people feel that, you know, we've been given authority over the earth and, that when, and God will take care of it for us. But it's more than just that. The human lifetime is, is pretty short. and and the earth seems to be pretty constant and it's hard for people to realize that, that uh, we could actually have an impact. Moreover, people realize that the earth was very different at one point in, human in, in the earth's history and, and, and are often told, well, there's natural variation. So um, they are, um, to be skeptical is reasonable, but then those people then, then do not look at any of the data that makes, makes it compelling. So I think it's a combination of uh, of that and the fact that some people have, for, for the average public, again, to some extent like evolution was, uh, there's a, it's very easy to pretend there's a controversy because you can always get some people to disagree. And if you present it as, as equal numbers or 50-50, then the public thinks there's a controversy. But for any topic you want, you can find an outlying person with a PhD to say, don't believe in it. And when they're given equal time on the air, the public gets a misimpression. So when you say education, it's not that you need a sophisticated education to to analyze climate change, the details of climate change, which, which to some extent experts are doing. What you need is an education that allows you to process to know when to be skeptical and, and, and which data and to seek empirical evidence and not and not and not authority or, or second hand or that's the kind of education that I think is deficient and as I was saying yesterday, I think that's what we really need to do for young people. So do you think if we did, you know, give the public better access to education about the realities of it, 
do you think that could help change come about because maybe then they would see these politicians who think that it's all you know a lie and, and well, teach a controversy and everything maybe they won't get elected to office my, my experience is whenever you've educated the public sufficiently about very sinful issues that they can make informed judgments on who to elect yes so and democracy only works if you have an informed populace and to some extent informed legislators but mostly an informed public and uh, I do think that if they had access to the proper information that they would be less susceptible to the to the uh, propaganda that many politicians generally purvey. And, and my, my experience from that was, for example, on a very different issue in Ohio when we, when, where, th where there was a group trying to, well, in many places, they're trying to push local school boards to have uh, creationists on them. I created an organization, helped create an organization called Help, Help Ohio Public Education Hope. And what we did was recruit candidates for school board who would base their decisions about so, uh, on curriculum, on science, and we informed the public of that. We, I wrote op-eds, we did that. And in every case, even though the, the, their opposing candidates outspent them by factors of 10 to 1, they were, they were elected. Well, so would you say that science and religion are reconcilable? I mean, do you think that's sort of the non-overlapping -overla magisteria? No, absolutely not. There are tons of overlapping magisteria and everywhere they overlap, religion is wrong. The vague notion of God or purpose may not be... Science can't disprove that, but the claims of each of the world's religions, they make claims about how the world works, and those claims are wrong. So science and organized religion certainly are not compatible, and to pretend otherwise is to be hypocritical. Um, there's no... Of course, there's no evidence for purpose in the universe. As I say, that doesn't disprove that there's purpose. But, but the relig world's religions do much more than that. They require a personal God that creates miracles that never have occurred and, and, and make statements about how the world works that are based clearly that were based on the knowledge of the people who wrote those things down thousands of years ago and they, they didn't even know the earth went around the sun. And so um, um, science is not compatible with, with a um, the doctrines of, uh, uh, of, of essentially almost all the world's religions. Now, you can try and say that they're allegorical in some way, but, but again, the, the claim that the world is made in some sense that there's a purpose in the universe based on us is, is uh, highly extraordinary, and a highly extraordinary claim requires some kind of extraordinary evidence that doesn't exist. So, how would you go about trying to improve education, and how would you try to change the fact that probably for wishful thinking reasons, among others, people still choose ideology over facts and evidence. Well, well, I think it's inevitable that people are not completely rational, but what I would do, and what we need to do in education is encourage kids to ask questions. Education is too, too fact-based, which is, in a world where facts are easy to access, fact-based education seems to me to be misplaced. What you want to teach is the process, the process of science of exploration, of questioning, of testing, and and the process that people can use to become lifelong learners, how to know to ask good questions and where to seek information and know. And and, and th that process is is what's really important. And and uh, and some and because the world is quanti because the world is described by mathematics, some quantitative literacy is is, is important. Um, and I think we we um, we we stu do students a disservice by suggesting that one kind of literacy is acceptable and another kind isn't. Now, of course, there's some cultural base school that has to provide you some base of history and language and literature and science. But most important is this idea of questioning. It seems to me, and so I would base the curriculum on questioning. That requires, however, a much more educated teacher base, because it's a lot easier to teach out of a book and some curriculum teach a set of facts than allow open questioning and be comfortable enough to be able to say, I don't know, which is really what more teachers and more parents should be comfortable saying. Right, I mean, it's kind of like what you mentioned yesterday about you want to have an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Yeah, and, and to say you don't know, and I mean, too many parents try to give answers without saying, I don't know, let's figure out how, how to answer the question. But I mean, even when things are so just demonstrably true, like 
the efficacy of vaccines, for example, you still have lots and lots of people who just, for whatever reasons, won't uh, accept reality. And do you think that there's anything that can really change people like that and change their minds? Or do you think it's more important to try to focus on the moderates who may be on no, the I fence? I think it's or... more important to focus on the majority of people. But I think that people, you, people undoubtedly, can't, you can't change minds. People can change their own minds. So ultimately, the only hope is to present people with, get people to recognize their own misconceptions. You saying you're wrong doesn't have much of an effect, but if you work with people, and it's so Socrates started it, but it works it well, if you work through with people things that ultimately lead them to a contradiction on the basis of their own thinking, then they may have an aha experience. And so I think encouraging people to think about their own beliefs is really, again, what education is all about. That's what we can do, what I try and do, and as well as getting people excited and motivated enough to think about the world. Um, the, 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 I think, I think we, we, we want to get them to question their own beliefs, and it's hard to do that. We, you know, we're not hardwired to do that, which is one of the reasons why, why it's so uncomfortable for many people. Well, I mean, that kind of reminds me also of the, uh, the whole, you know, quote unquote, teacher controversy with evolution and creationism, and I think a large part of that is because a lot of creationists sort of wrongly equate evolution with atheism. And they do, and and, and 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 they and the problem is many people get taught that in school that to accept science requires you to be an atheist. Now, I think, to be honest, I think ultimately the reason most scientists are atheists is, in fact, the more you learn about the universe, the, the more silly the, the doctrines seem to be. But I have a number of colleagues who are probably religious who are scientists, and and so one of the more successful tax that I've taken when I was working on the evolution debate was to, was to point out just that, that you don't have to be an atheist to accept evolution. Because unfortunately in churches and schools around the country, kids are told, you know, science requires atheism, therefore science is bad, therefore ignore what the scientists say. Right, and they kind of... really, really a, Well, that's child abuse, as I've said. Right, and they kind of refer, refer to it as, you know, scientism and evolutionism and to try to yeah, deride they, it. They, you get, or there's all sorts of words that are used. There's... Uh, new atheism is a word that I uh, that is uh, I argued as you know at a, at a yep. recent event um, that you were at uh, is a derogatory term that has no meaning. Militant atheism is another. What's a militant atheist? Is someone who who, who heads up leaflets? I don't know what a militant <laughs> atheist is. Yeah, it does seem like kind of an oxymoron. Yeah, but it certainly it it, get, it has it's emotionally latent and uh, it, it it does the effect of marginalizing make it seem as if it's a small or, or, or a fringe fringe group of people and and uh, in fact one of the most useful things of some of the work I do and movies we made and other things is, is having people realize that they're not alone that it's very widespread that, that, that very few very few people will actually believe the stuff of the Bible right I mean and then you also have politicians who either do believe it like Ben Carson who you know I mean, I don't really have anything good to say about him, but I mean, yeah, then you have people like Donald Trump who are very clearly faking it. You know, when he goes up there and talks about communion and he says, when I ate the little cracker, and he keeps making a point of saying that the Bible is his favorite book. Yeah, I mean, well, it, I, I, it's not plausible. there are other people like Barack Obama who, who, or Bill Clinton who would amaze me if they really... Well, Bill, my Hillary, Hillary is for example, is, who, who, who are required in our current society to, to appear to be religious but I suspect are um, agnostic at, at, at best. But I think it's a requirement, and it's an unfortunate one. Um, but the, what, what's happened is that they've usurped the morality so that, so that most people claim they're religious, and there's a good evidence for this in a, in a study that Richard Dawkins did in, in, in England uh, following people's the census where 54% of people claimed they were Christian, which is an all-time low, but Exploring those people, out, ultimately ask them why they said they were Christian, that they believe in the doctrines of Christian faith, and they said no, but the, ultimately the answer to why they reported themselves as Christian is that we like to think of ourselves as good people. And in our society right now, that, that is, that's the status quo, that's the norm, the standard, that somehow not being religious, being religious is part of being a good person. And, and we won't get people to change until we can confront that directly. 
So in a country like the U.S., where polls, you know, several polls have shown that on you know, levels of trustworthiness, atheists are atheists are ranked below rapists, and well, we're at the very bottom. With, I'll, I'll par with rapists. Okay. Um, well, do you think? Do you think anytime in the near future we'll have an openly atheist, even a presidential candidate, let alone one who might oh, get elected? That's a good question. By the way, I, just for the camera, I'm yelling not because the questions are difficult, but <laughs> anyone who knows what it's like on a ship knows you tend to do that. Oh yeah. It, Rocky makes it hard. Drake passage but, isn't uh, easy. Uh, but yeah, but. Um, I don't, I'd like to think that that might, uh, look, I, I think, uh, as Richard said in our movie, I think it's already happened, but they're closet atheists, but, but an op openly atheist president, I, I think that's a long way away. Um, you know, but things could change. I, I wrote a piece saying, you know, it's all, and it may have sounded naive, but we're always just one generation away. If we get, if, if the children can be reached in one generation way, and the example I used is that I, you know a generation ago, there's no way you would think that openly gay candidates could ever get elected, and yeah. they can. And so, um, I think I think uh, it just requires it one generation to change your views. And so it, it's 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 religion has been around for a long time and it's pervasive in most societies. It's hard to imagine it's going to disappear. But what I think you might imagine, and it's already it's, it's already happening. I mean, you could extrapolate. In every Western society, the number of people who declare themselves as religious is, is going down um, monotonically. So I suppose you could project and see what hits the axis. But, but of course, there are forces working against that. But I think education inevitably will leads to less belief. And um, and the interesting thing is, it also goes through cycles. I think we we. We've had times when there were presidents who didn't wear the religion on the sleeve, in particular the founding fathers. <laughs> but but even a guy who's really religious, like Jimmy Carter, never held his religion on the sleeve. Right. And so, um, uh, I think uh, I think these are their cycles. And right now, we're in this cycle where jingoistic patriotism and religion are both seem to be required. But but I, I like to think that this too shall pass. Yeah. I mean, I. At least, maybe, I mean, this might be wishful thinking, but I think that it's sort of in the death throes, and that's why you're seeing them become so vocal. I mean, well, Richard said that, and I, you know, in some places there is, they, they feel threatened and therefore have to feel, have to strike out. I think there's no doubt that they feel threatened. But right now, I think uh, to argue that Christmas is under attack is just so ridiculous. <laughs> I, I think there's no. The media are pretty effectively controlled by by, by forces that, that, that are religious in one way or another. And I think uh, um, you won't... I was just looking at a picture uh, for the New York Times this morning when I opened up. It was a picture. I don't know what they were doing, but the, the president and Paul Ryan and Harry Reid were all bowing their heads for some reason. And, um, you know, they didn't have the caption, why are these men bowing their heads? And... Uh, uh, so what, maybe, maybe someday we'll have that. Well, I mean, I, it, even as, as recently as maybe a week and a half ago or so, there was a case, there was a school in rural Louisiana that was openly teaching creationism. Uh, and there they, are many schools that still are. They, they got a letter from, I think, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, mm -hmm. and they responded by saying, I'm not going to go into hiding as a Christian, and I'm not going to be criminalized as a Christian. And so when there are things like that, I don't understand maybe you can suggest something on how to fight that when people are just so irrational that basically they think that the laws don't apply to them because well, Christians think, aren't I think, I are above the law the, um, the separation of church and state is an interesting issue and um, and I think that w what we have to re reiterate is that people are allowed to think whatever they want Democratic society, and even speak out about whatever they want, but their actions are subject to the law. And what we have to do is not attack creationism per se, but what we have to do is say, is demonstrate effectively that it isn't science, and that what should be taught in a science classroom is science. And so I think I'm very careful in debating when, when I have debated. 
is to not debate evolution versus creationism because that's not debatable. There's no doubt. There's no debate. Right. But to argue what what merits creationism has as a science and then explore them quick, point by point. And as you know, because we've talked about it, the Dover the Dover trial is a great example of doing just that. And the judges, the Republican judges, brilliant summary is one of the finest pieces. I not that I've read a lot of legal writing, but one of the finest pieces of legal writing I've ever read. I agree. I mean, it really just called them out on, on lying it about just, all of it. Yeah, it was just a brilliant piece of logical discussion demonstrating once more that it wasn't, it did not attacking the tenets of creationism or religion, not attacking the tenets of religion, but saying that religion cannot impose a, a education that's inconsistent with the evidence. That's the main thing, and, and um, we want our children to be, to, to have their to, to be their education based on evidence and, and, and thinking. Well, so in that vein, I mean, I have a question that's sort of inspired by a question that I heard somebody ask Richard Dawkins, and it was a evolution-based question. But if you could just pick one fact or one line of evidence that shows that the universe really is 13.8 billion years old, and that it's impossible for it to be six or ten thousand years old. What would that I, be? I come out with new ones all the time because you <laughs> see that people like at the Creation Museum like to come up with counter arguments to everything. So I try and come up with a new argument. My favorite, because they don't, they're ignorant. Because most people don't know that the. My favorite is to ask, how long does it take a photon, a particle of light, to get out from the inside of the sun to the outside? It's emitted from the nuclear actions of the sun. You know, but now the right. sun is shining out there somewhere. And uh, how long does it take light to get from the inside to the outside? And the answer happens to be about a million years. The light scatters. It takes all that time yeah. to get out. So, so if the Earth was 6,000 years old, the sun wouldn't be shining. So uh, now, you can never counter. People can say, well, all the God, sun, God created the sun shining. Right, but special then, pleading. But then you can say, well, God created, then God created us three seconds ago with the illusion of having this conversation. And there's no way I can disprove that. But you can point out that um, you have to ask yourself the question, why would a, a creator create a universe in which every single piece of data points consistently together towards an age? Is, is it, well, then it's pretty devious and mischievous God, and then why would you want to, why would you want to uh, have faith in, why would you want to honor such a, or, or, or obey such a creepy guy, or, or, <laughs> or it, or whatever? And also, like, why would he have created a world with so many incompatible religions instead of just one religion that everybody believes. Well, there's lots in. of things, but I think the bottom line is that, that um, you know, if you pick evidence about carbon dating, all these things, that, the, the familiar ones, that then these religious, the, the f fundamentalist groups um, have have already hit on them. So, you know, the fact that star, the, the size of our galaxy is 100,000 years away. But, I mean, you could just show that when it's, I mean, I, I, here's another one. I'd say, okay, look, when a star explodes, we know how much energy is emitted by a star that's exploding. We can see it, and 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 in in, in another galaxy, and and uh, or in the edge of our galaxy, and and we 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 can work out the science of it. We work out the science of neutrinos from the sun, so we know how the sun works. And the number of neutrinos we measured from the large black giant cloud tells us unambiguously that it was 160,000 light years away, unambiguously telling us, in fact, that it would take 160,000 years for those neutrinos to get to us. So we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have seen it anyway. But, but as we've talked, there's certain people you can't argue with who, who don't. I mean, people don't want to hear things that don't make them that 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 make them feel uncomfortable. And as I said, one of the purposes of science, but I believe more generally education, is to precisely make people feel uncomfortable. Because if you're not uncomfortable, then you're not really learning. You're, you're always in your comfort zone. You're not confronting anything beyond it. And a lot of it, I think, is because people hear pseudoscience and it's presented as fact. I mean, things like Deepak Chopra and Dr. Oz, who just, just, they just gibberish, and yet a lot of people believe it because, again, like Chopra and Oz, you know, they've doctor attached to their names, and they say things that I like to think if you don't think about ben it. Carson has done a tremendous amount for reducing the currency of having doctor. Before your name, <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah, but it's more than that. It's that the, is that somehow the media, um, well, they know that somehow the, the, it's always been the case 
the people who make fantastic claims can get attention from groups that are trying to sell things, be it snake oil salesmen in the old days. I mean, the business of TV and is to is to get people to watch it. Some people they see the ads, and uh, and so they'll they'll cater to those people who bring in viewers. And what we have to do, and this is the hard part, but we have is con- is not. It's easy to make the real science as entertaining as the crap. What's hard is to convince the media people that the real science is inter- as interesting as the crap. So the, the real thing we have to do is convince the media people that they'll get as many viewers from having really interesting real stuff as having some. But the problem is, it's hard. It's hard. If you, if you go on TV and say, look, I'm going to tell you how to live longer. I'm going to tell you to live longer and be happier. <laughs> well, it's hard to compete with that. So how would you go about trying to convince the media that the real science, you know, that science fact is better than science well, fiction? by demonstration. Or myth. By demonstration of, of showing people that that that, uh, that something you do has a has a big viewership and that you can and so that's why I'm involved in more media activities to try and show to try and demonstrate that we try with the origins project when when, when I tell people that we run events on science that 3,000 members of the public pay to go see they're incredulous because it just doesn't seem like 3,000 people would pay to see science but as you know it happens all the time in, in, in Arizona yeah I mean there really are Lots of people who are interested, and, and it, you don't see that on the media. There are they tons st- of, every time we do anything, people are craving it. People ask what's next. People are craving. People crave science. And, and I even say, my friend, I used to be the head of the foundation, the Science Friday Foundation. My head, I reflect, my friend Ira Flato, who's a radio person who does Science Friday, that's got something like 3 million, uh, a listenership of 3 million people. That's not trivial. Well, do you think that's got anything to do with education? Maybe if because there's so many of you know, people like me who are laymen who just love to learn about science, but maybe if, if they taught it better in schools, maybe there'd be more scientists, or well, what, I, I don't think, know. I think we, it's, it, there's, look, it's chicken and eggs, but, but yeah, of course we have to do a better job teaching, getting kids excited about science and teaching them that it's part of being a, an educated and cultured person, but it's not just in schools, in society we have to do that. Right now, ignorance of science is no impediment to great success, apparently, and great respect in the community. I mean, you know, look at the presidential candidates yeah. who somehow... And so we have to somehow work towards creating a culture where if, if those candidates couldn't read, <laughs> if they couldn't read, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have any... They wouldn't get respect among the public. So we have to, we have to create a, a situation where scientific illiteracy is as embarrassing... As, as verbal illiteracy, and um, that takes time. An example, it's not. There's no silver bullet, I think. Right, but I mean, it does seem like you know, for a lot of these people, they wear their ignorance like a badge of courage or something. I mean, a badge like of a, honor. Yeah, badge of honor. Well, in our society, look, I taught at Yale University for what seemed like forever, um, and uh, you know, and it was a badge of honor for these people were claiming that they were culture, the cultured elite, but that, but there was always a badge of honor. Say, you know, that science stuff, I just just can't can't do it. But if you if, if they ever said, you know, that history, I just can't understand it, they would be laughed out of the room. And so we allow that, we allow it. And in the if the cultural elites also purvey this notion that somehow it, you can be a cultured, well-educated individual and have no appreciation of science. Um, then you know, then, then it's bad. That's one of the reasons why uh, we've tried to bring in cultural role models, people whose jobs have nothing to do with science, but are well known to the public: writers, directors, actors, uh, 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 and sometimes even politicians. Um, and show people that they're fascinated. They're not only just fascinated, but they know something. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. And uh, and again, I've said this many times, but you know, you, in our society, you can really enjoy rock music without playing a guitar and you can really enjoy art without being Picasso or you can really enjoy going to a play without being Shakespeare or pick your favorite playwright or Tom Stoppard or someone but but for some reason the view is that you can't enjoy science without being a scientist or even appreciate it and I, I'm, I have no musical ability even in spite of the numerous things on my CV that makes it look like I do and uh, uh, but I enjoy music 
That kind of reminds me of what Richard Feynman said about knowing mechanisms and how things work merely makes you appreciate it even more. Well, it, it does, and it's it's there's a there's an aha experience that when I used to work at Science Museum, we talk. It's orgasmic. Everyone loves to suddenly understand something they didn't understand before. It's natural. We're we're hardwired as humans, really, to want to solve puzzles. We get pleasure from it, and the, science is really nothing other than in some sense a very sophisticated form of that. That's why children like science so much and we beat it out of them. Yeah, I mean, who is it, uh, was it Carl Sagan who said, you know, that some of them just happen to filter through and become scientists? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. It's, there's a lot of factors. But, but, and they're good teachers, too. I mean, a lot of, not, all of us have had good teachers about, inspired us, or most of us have, uh, in one way or another, uh, to, to, to excel or to go outside our comfort zone. But, uh, but there's no doubt that, that that science in school turns many people off. For many, for many individuals, they're not lucky enough to have a comfortable with science teacher. And the fact, as David in our group was mentioning, but it's true that it's even worse at the middle school level, that over 90%, I think, of middle school science teachers really don't have any background in science. So if they don't feel comfortable in it, the students are going to feel comfortable with it. And I've seen it happen in grade three or four when my daughter you know, was there, and I went into the classroom and the teacher just was so uncomfortable with the material that how could the kids feel comfortable with it? That's true. I mean, I mean, it's three, three or four. What he learned? It's it's light during the day. It's dark at night. I mean, it's not it's not you know. And it's the kind of stuff that anyone should feel comfortable talking about. But somehow they don't. Anyway. All right. Well. Okay. Maybe one or two more questions. All right. Um, do you think that physics goes beyond the standard model? Of course. So. We already have evidence that, it, that the standard model doesn't explain everything. For example, neutrino masses um, are not accommodated within the standard model. But also, the standard model has more questions than answers, which is one of the one of the facets of the new book I, I, I finished that's going to come out in a year from now. So, do you think it's supersymmetry, supersymmetry, or could it be something else? And what would be unambiguous evidence of supersymmetry, and or that it is something else? Well, I mean, you know, who knows in advance? I mean, it's a guess, anyone's guess, but supersymmetry is well molded by, by a lot of indirect reasons. But the evidence for supersymmetry would be to see, discover the particles, the, the partners of the normal matter. Supersymmetry suggests or implies that there's a, for every particle we see in nature, there's a supersymmetric partner with certain characteristics. And if you started seeing them, that would be evidence of it. Not seeing them, however, is not evidence, unfortunately, that it doesn't exist, because right. it could exist in ours. But... but but any surprising discovery at the Large Hadron Collider that wasn't supersymmetry would suggest that maybe with that is, is, is the wrong direction. So we'll have to see. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Oh, good. Thank you. And, and, um, and keep up your own work. Thank you.